Good afternoon. My name is Glenda Alvin. I'm Dean of Libraries and Media Centers at Tennessee State University, and I'm one of the conference directors for the Charleston Library Conference. I'm welcoming you uh, here to our stopwatch session. The stopwatch has presentations that are short. Uh, they last about six minutes, but we, we had one um, presenter who could not come, so I have expanded to seven minutes each. <laughs> I'm going to have the presenters introduce themselves, and they will follow in the order that is printed on the program. The question and answer period will follow after all of the presentations have been concluded. So we'll start off with our first one. nice long time to look at our title, but uh, <laughs> we're going to talk to you today about integrating library materials purchasing into the campus ERP. Uh, I'm Jamie Cavallo, I'm an assistant director for budget and finance at the NYU Division of Libraries, and this is my colleague Greg Ferguson, who is the head of our acquisitions department. An enterprise resource planning ERP system is software that's used to collect, store, manage, and interpret data from many business activities. In the case of our talk, it's the procurement of goods and services. So we'll quickly go through our migration process, the benefits and challenges of an ERP for library acquisitions, and lessons we learned throughout the process. So prior to migrating, NYU Libraries, NYU Procurement, and NYU Accounts Payable agreed on a workflow where library materials purchasing wasn't tracked in the ERP. Uh, the library exported invoice data from the ILS to AP who issued payments, and the library itself kept the audit trail on paper. Uh, this was good for us because it was a simple workflow for handling our 8,000 plus payments annually. Um, but Library materials didn't have official university POs or a central record of who authorized the spending. Central Finance didn't like this, so they asked us to migrate. So uh, this shows a breakdown of our material spending. Prior to the migration, uh, we had the only thing in the system was binding, so that means we had to move approximately 97% of our material spending. To start, we had to include all of the relevant departments, both within libraries and across the university. Uh, this was and the library's collection development, library's acquisitions, library's budget and finance, NYU procurement, and NYU accounts payable. We had to identify all the different ways that we pay for materials, like multi-year commitments, annual renewals of subscriptions, one-time acquisitions of special collections, and more. We had to map each different type of purchase to the correct ordering process in the ERP, and we had to provide training to acquisition staff who maybe never needed to use the ERP system before. Simultaneously, we coordinated meetings with NYU Procurement and NYU AP. We had to kind of impress on them the uh, volume of transactions they would start seeing once we migrated, again, 8,000 plus annually, and we had to seek advice um, on seek advice from them on the types of purchases that didn't quite fit with the available options that were in the ERP. Lastly, we had to make sure that the library staff understood each of their new roles, whether this was putting together an order in the system, submitting the order, or approving the order. And this was all before it went to central procurement. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the benefits and the challenges to using the ERP from the library's point of view after we've gone live. Uh, you know, it didn't, that was just the beginning of the migration process. We worked really closely with procurement, uh, forged some strong relationships with them. That was great. It helped us out a lot. Um, and now I'm going to talk about what it's been like to use it for us. Um, so first we're going to talk about the benefits. Um, one of the major benefits is visibility, right? All relevant departments in the library and different units in the central finance office, right? We all have a single source of truth about our material payments. Previously, they couldn't see into the ILS. They just got the data that we sent to them. Um, and so it was kind of a black box for them. Um, specifically and importantly, um, the ERP enforces the university's signature authority policy so that spending decisions 
by the staff with uh, fiscal responsibility are kept in a uh, centralized place. Um, and at the library previously, a lot of this was just done like verbally or via email. The person with the authority would just be like, go for it. And then we would go buy that thing. But there wasn't, you know, like a, a record that people could easily refer to later. And that was a good. Um, and um, risk management is another benefit. Um, you know, purchasing requests don't apply with policy. They can be rejected ahead of time before you get yourself into trouble. Um, and so using the ERP is very beneficial overall, but it does have real challenges for library workflow, especially if you aren't used to it before, if you're used to doing something else, um, there are some real challenges. First, um, library materials don't fit nicely into a lot of ERP workflows. We use um, a system called Jagger, some other institutions use Workday, and they're these kind of like one size fits all systems that you know university outsources to you know some, some software publisher. And I think most of us know most library materials aren't like other goods and services. Like you can't like go shop around when you want to buy like a rare book or like a particular e-resource package or you want an approval plan from South America, right? Like there's just like not, you can't negotiate on price, but then like I'm gonna go to the other guy. Um, so because of that, it takes regular communication between us and our procurement department to get our purchasing through the ERP's workflows, which are mostly based around this assumption that you know you, you should you can you can find you know the best supplier for you out of many options. There's also been some tension between uh, the university's desire to run contracts through our uh, standardized central review process versus the, at the library we want to retain control over your resources licensing right and not have to run it through their processes. So far we've been successful in that. But the topic always comes up every once in a while. We try to be like no like you know we have experienced your resources librarians they really know what they're doing. Um, so, so far, so good with that, but that is a topic that comes up. Another challenge is new layers of work. Um, like Jamie mentioned, our previous process was highly automated. It was wonderful for us from a workflow point of view. Um, most orders and invoices took only a few clicks in ILS to initiate, and now every single order and invoice requires multiple manual steps in the, ER, in a, in the ERP in addition to that. So there's a lot of double entry of data about the same orders and invoices. And this means a lot of new work for technical services. They didn't give us new staff. They gave us a lot of new work, but they didn't give us more staff. Um, so it's time spent on this that we're not spending on other, uh, on other tasks. In some ways, it's also made work less flexible. Um, so now in our ERP, we have many uh, large standing orders, large encumbrances um, for you know, where we buy the same kind of thing from a certain supplier throughout the year. So that requires a lot of planning, monitoring, coordination with the vendors to make sure we're not over or underspent at the end of the year. And that's like a, the, a new aspect of this for us where previously it was a lot looser and we could, um, we could manage the budget in other ways. And um, ERP workflows around um, registration, suppliers register themselves in the system and around um, ins uh, insurance compliance are, get, you know, are just rigid and opaque and it makes it difficult to work with small suppliers who have difficulty navigating the process. Maybe they're a small bookshop in another country, and you know, English isn't the first language, or they're just some individual who is selling you their archive, and they're just like, what are you talking about when you're asking me all these questions? So um, using the ERP overall is beneficial. Um, you know, our previous workflow was highly efficient, but it wasn't. Um, we reached the end. <laughs> I missed the one. I, oh, our lessons learned. I'm so sorry. So you can see them here, planning, organizational key, those relationships with folks in procurement? Oh yeah, pretty much mentioned them. Uh, and then the last thing is we migrated in January 2022, uh, but the process has continued to develop after, and so we're still working on improvements today. Thank you. So hello everyone, it's just a coincidence that the two NYU presenters were back to back for not <laughs> taking over. I'm Dan Hickey, I'm the head of the business library at NYU. This is Jane Excel, our assistant director of collections. And I should say like between Greg and Jamie and Jane, these are all the people that allow me to buy all the cool stuff that I buy. So <laughs> thank you to my colleagues. Um, today we're here to talk about threading the SSO needle. 
So one thing we've noticed at NYU is that increasingly vendors are looking to implement SSO. Oftentimes, they're thinking about SSO as a speedy fix to problems that they've been having in the past with different types of access to our databases. And we wanted to talk about how rushing into SSO implementations may not always be the right choice for end users or for the library. So we began by thinking about two case studies that we had while we were at NYU. So the first implementation is that of a major financial product that shall remain unnamed, although there are some <laughs> business librarians in the room who I'm sure who could guess. And then we'll also talk about an implementation that went really well for a product called DRAM. Um, so for our major financial data product, we signed on very early because we knew that we needed to get into this product quickly because we had a problem with maintaining individual accounts for the product. But what we didn't realize is that it would take over nine months to get us to the point where the SSO implementation was successful. As you can imagine, there were big red flags throughout that process about how challenging that was and about what that meant in terms of paying that invoice. So we did have access to the product, um, but it was not the SSO access that we were promised. Um, we know other people for the same product who haven't had access for over a year. So that was cold comfort, if you will. Um, we were unable to authorize on our preferred attribute. So we have very clear flags in our SSO backend that allow people to self-identify um, with, uh, with library privileges. And so their team, unfortunately, didn't have the technical expertise to be able to select kind of the appropriate flag. And then by the time our SSO implementation was in place, the vendor was actually moving to a new SSO system. So we felt like the rug had been pulled out from under us in a way, in that our team had really handheld this vendor throughout the whole process. I'm turning to Jane because Jane really handheld during this whole process. And there were all types of things. There were behavioral issues with the vendor that were just beyond the pale. Um, but what we found was we wish we had gone into this knowing some different things and with clearer eyes. And then finally, and I'm not sure if we still have no plan for deprovisioning, but we had to insist that they take on the responsibility for deprovisioning for the SSO instance because we felt that the vendor wasn't taking deprovisioning seriously enough. So cutting users off after they graduate, for example. I'm going to turn it over to Jane to talk about the other implementation. Yeah, and I'll speak just briefly about this one, but just, you know, for contrast, <laughs> our this other implementation, which was the database of recorded American music, and this was actually the very first SSO external e-resource implementation that we ever adopted in like 2015 or 2016, which actually predated my time managing these implementations. And in fact, I did not even know that it was SSO until at some point our central IT you know, sent a list of our SSO integrations to check on them. And I was like, what is this? What is that doing here? You know, And then I go in and try it, and it's working perfectly fine. It's been chugging along, just no problems at all for like eight years at that point almost. You know, it was like continuing to update, continuing to authorize on the attributes that we wanted. And in fact, you know, was in many ways maintaining itself much more easily than some of our IP authentication stuff where we then have to you know, keep sending new IPs and changing our IPs and oh, now we've added this other campus or this other area, you know, which I think is part of the reason I also didn't even know it existed. It was flying so under the radar because it was requiring almost no maintenance. And um, it also checks the attributes on every login. So luckily we also weren't having a problem where people who were students in 2015 were continuing to access it. It was working as expected. So that's a way to say that we're not anti-SSO. We actually like SSO, but we think it's important to bring it on in an intelligent way. Um, so for technical implementations, we just wanted to talk through some of the main things that we've been seeing, which on the library side, SSO, especially when it's centrally administered and not administered by the library, it takes implementation out of your direct control. So IP authentication, as a method really helps you um, control the, that process from nuts to soup and really gives you a lot of autonomy. 
um, spinning SSO, taking on an SSO instance and having it spun out into the main IT um, unit, not only does it take it out of our hands, but it pushes the library further into the realm of identity management. And identity management can be so fraught because at the end of the day, the library itself isn't similar to the bursar or something like that. We shouldn't have to necessarily be doing that type of work. Um, on the vendor side, some vendors aren't used to academic customers. Oftentimes, a lot of the vendors that are most eager about SSO want to work with us but haven't worked with academe in the past or are just debuting this. So I'm one of the business librarians. We've got a couple business librarians in here. And I think like it's very, very common um, for business products to say, we can, oh, we, can, we can work with you, but you really have to have SSO. And then there are assumptions underlying the rush to SSO, which we kind of want to say, like, oh, let's pump the brakes on this. This isn't necessarily true. So IP authentication does not um, necessarily reflect today's uh, global learning environment and is not sufficiently secure. We hear security a lot. SSO allows for better, more granular control, and it's needed for expensive products or products with commercial applications. We've only got a minute. I know, right? so yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> like, only very briefly touch on this because I want to get to our lessons or advice. Um, but yes, we have seen a lot of sort of unintended consequences, some that are good, as I said, you know, where things just continue to run along the way we want. But walk in access has been a challenge for us. People who want to just take their laptop and, you know, use Wi Fi and just go to Google and like click directly into those things and they're on a, an NYU IP, you know, that is not going to be as easy. But then on the user side, you know, if they are logged in already, then there's fewer clicks to get them to that resource with SSO. They have that personalized account, good and bad, in terms of the end user data being passed on, something that we're still working on. Um, and as Dan just said, opens up that access that we didn't have. And so that brings us to best practices and what we learned. I'm going to power through these very quickly. Um, it allows you to be a first mover on some resources. We can talk about these if you see them. Um, it really, uh, Patron privacy is kind of one of those where it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Don't agree on that start date, like our first case study, so you're not um, caught feeling ridiculous. Um, get your materials into your people's hands as quickly as possible, um, and then deploy it selectively because you only have so much bandwidth to bring on these instances. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the coordinator of scholarly communication and resource services with rank of assistant professor at DePaul University or in layman's terms I uh, run technical services I catalog everything I run the institutional repository and I'm an advocate for OER and affordable course materials and I'm here to tell you a little about our reserves focused grant funded CDL program so the environment of DePaul University, we're located in Greencastle, Indiana, around 45 minutes west of Indianapolis in the middle of some cornfields. <laughs> we are a small liberal arts college teaching focus and our library uh, mission focuses on supporting the curriculum. We have uh, a few offices of, in our main library that I have listed here. Um, and I just wanted to mention that we do have a music library branch in our performing arts building, as well as seven faculty librarians and seven staff. So our building was planned to go under renovation in March of 2020. They had already started closing down the um, stacks, packing everything up, librarians were moving to uh, other offices, and uh, we finally opened in January of 2023. So this meant, again, our collection was packed away. We could not have um, physical course reserves as well as just other pandemic-related libraries trying to buy stuff <coughs> issues. Um, so we were not always able to provide access to the text requested by faculty. And the trends in controlled digital lending were top of mind, especially to me as the Skullcom librarian. So DePaul is part of PALNI, the Private Academic Library Network of Indiana. And we created a working group to apply for a PALNI innovation grant. So these are an annual grant that one of the member schools can apply. Um, and they really just want to support uh, teaching and the library services as well as 
uh, try to have pro projects that could be replicable at other uh, Palini schools. So we were awarded $10,000 from Palini to purchase the necessary scanner and DRM software technology to support a controlled digital lending service. Um, and then we decided to use our electronic course management system, ARIES, to uh, control the links. So once we received our funding, uh, our working group set up and attended various vendor demonstrations via Zoom. We talked to ScanX, Kick, File Open, and Lock Lizard, which has a fun name. Um, our final choice was the ScanX overhead book scanner. Um, and we decided to work with File Open over Lock Lizard for the DRM software since they offered us uh, a partnership in testing DRM as kind of a new service of their company. Um, and they, so they were really able to um, individualize our instance and work with us um, individually that way. And then we uh, had to make some updates to Aries, but that way it fell into our electronic course reserve um, workflow. So we figured out with the grant money to buy the scanner and the DRM software. This is just a little bit about how that workflow ended up adding into our um, regular course reserves and purchasing workflows. So because I run acquisitions, I could see faculty purchase requests, oh, this would be a good <coughs> option for controlled digital lending. Or a reserve specialist would receive a request, say we can't uh, access this, but we could put one chapter or we could scan, scan the entire book and make it available through ARIES. And so this is our um, usage from our spring semester um, pilot cohort. And you can see here that the usage numbers might be low, but the total number of students enrolled in these courses was only 40. We are a small liberal arts college. <laughs> um, so we hope that because this was our first time the students were using a new, um, a new system that, the, and once the faculty learn more about it, that we'll be able to scale it up in the future. And some other uh, possibilities we've discussed for scaling up the project include um, document delivery. We don't uh, do any of that. We just do um, ILL and uh, article delivery. So we talked about uh, also putting the scanner out in a more public area because it does have a very simple um, user-friendly uh, scanning interface with a touchscreen monitor. Um, and then our consortium runs PalShare, which is a inter um, Palni school ILL lending. And we thought it would be uh, great to start creating a repository of the scans of the items Palni schools are requesting from us so that we can start creating that backbone of the scans to be able to use in the future. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So since I'm going last, does that mean I get extra time? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm Edward Leonard, Director of Collections and Technical Services at the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. And I want to talk to you today about an approach that we use with virtual vendor visits that we started a couple of years ago and found um, quite effective. So if you're not familiar with us, Virginia Tech is a comprehensive research university We've been around, we just celebrated our 150th anniversary last year. We've got more than 38,000 students. We are largely kind of a traditional residential campus. And at the state level, we're a member of the VIVA consortium within Virginia. So I've been at Virginia Tech for many years. I started as a science reference librarian and more recently have moved into collection management. And for many years, our visits with vendors were largely driven by the vendors themselves, so they were a bit haphazard. Um, people would contact us, say we're going to be in town next week kind of thing, and expect us to drop everything and meet with them. So the dates and times could be kind of random. The agenda was typically set by the vendor. 
And we found in many cases they often took kind of that cookie cutter approach, even to the extent that sometimes the slides would have a different institution name on them. <laughs> and not surprisingly, the attendance and participation in those sessions was usually pretty low. So in 2017, we did, decided to try something new. We instituted uh, Virginia Tech Vendor Week, and it was basically an intensive week-long session that we held in the spring. And all the sessions were still held in person, but they were invitation only. So we reached out to about 30 vendors and got 24, typically, who in indicated interest. In future years, we got um, even higher rates of return. And I did a presentation on this, I believe, in this very same room back in 2017. So it is in the Charleston Conference Proceedings if you're interested in, in seeing a little bit more about it. So some of the advantages of this approach was it gave us much more control over the process. It was kind of exciting, um, sort of like a mini Charleston in the springtime and the difference with the vendors coming to us. Our turnout improved significantly. We typically had 12 to 15 people coming in each session, sometimes more for the, the more general kinds of products. Uh, importantly, we also had the key people in the room, and by that I mean our linking person, our usage stats person, our payment person, etc., as well as the subject librarians. And each year we typically set one or more topics or themes, so it might be text and data mining, uh, DEI, et cetera. And having all of them in a fairly close um, time frame also made it a bit easier to compare products. Some of the challenges were just trying to pack all those into a week made um, a bit of a logistical nightmare sometimes, especially if there were any schedule changes. It also meant that we gave up our entire spring break because that was the only time we could get a room for the block of time that we needed. Another thing was that it was close to the end of our fiscal year, so it meant we had to make decisions and make them very quickly and try to get the paperwork and licensing through to get it on that fiscal year. In 2021, we switched to a virtual approach and this is not a typo. We did actually have an in-person session in 2020. That was in mid-March, and it was a very interesting week. It was things were shutting down around us as we were going, and many vendors actually told us it was their last on-site visit at the time. But so 2021, we switched to a virtual format. We decided that having a week-long um, intensive Zoom session was not what we wanted to do. <laughs> So we switched to a weekly series, um, once a week, uh, mid, middle of the week at lunchtime, and tried to stick with a consistent day and time. As I mentioned, we did them through Zoom. The sessions were all recorded, which proved very helpful. And we'll talk about that a little more here. So some advantages were the, for particularly for smaller vendors, we're located in kind of a rural part of southwestern Virginia. It's a bit of a trip to get to us. You have to really want to come. <laughs> and so for smaller vendors that might not have the resources, they can now participate more fully. For our own librarians, they could join remotely, our branch folks or somebody who's teleworking, that kind of thing. With the recordings, we could watch at a later time. And the transcripts also made it easier if we were looking to purchase a product, we could go back and review exactly what, what the vendor had to say about mm -hmm. that. Also, the sessions were more spread out, so from uh, approval and payment kind of side, it made it easier. Uh, logistical challenges are less. There's still some dif different people were not familiar with Zoom, that kind of thing. Most of that has since passed. We did have fewer time slots because we moved to weekly, so we had 16 slots in the most recent. And with the, the virtual format, it can be a little bit harder to build that excitement level. One other thing I'll share is that the captioning to do the recordings often requires a lot of cleanup afterwards. Um, had some interesting things that slipped through on at least the auto captioning need to be cleaned up before we posted those. 
So sharing a few recommendations, I do think it's important that you choose a consistent virtual platform. We opted for Zoom because we're a Zoom campus, but uh, Teams, Google Meeting, et cetera, that could work. But whatever it is, pick what, what works for you. We've talked about recording. Um, I did have a web page with expectations for vendors, so that communicated that to them. And I thought it was also important to, to mention about share what makes your institution unique, because again, each place has their own characteristics, what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do, and the vendors can help match their products to those. And so finally, here's my contact information, and thank you for having me.